Welcome back everyone. You're watching Centerline Designs. My name's Cole and today we're going to be doing a video on how to AC TIG welding aluminum. I want to take you through start to finish. Uh, if you have no experience with this, I want to get you going, help you get started. It's not that difficult. We're going to go through everything from tungsten selection, setting up your torch, uh, to the base material prep, machine settings, gas flows, and I'd like to do some passes, show you some what the good welds should look like and what some not good welds look like. Like if you have uh, poor shielding gas or um, improper machine setup, things like that. It might help you troubleshoot when you're getting started. If you're not getting the results you want, we'll be able to compare to what I'm doing here and hopefully that'll help you uh, get on the right path. So with that being said, let's get started. So today, the welder we're gonna be using is the first CT 2050 provided by Yes Welder. Um, I've been doing quite a few videos on it already through various different builds. I'm really liking the machine. It's the machine today. I'm going to show you how to get the settings set up on. Um, but all the other parts as far as tungsten, torch setup, gas, material prep is all going to be the same no matter what machine you have. So really the only specifics come to the actual user menu on the machine. With that being said, let's get started with the tungsten. If you're new to TIG welding, Tungsten is the electrode that's used to transfer the arc between the TIG torch and your workpiece, the base metal. In this case, it's going to be aluminum. And there's many different types of tungstens out there. Uh, the two common types that I'm always going to for AC TIG welding and also DC, because these two can be used for either or, is a 1.5 or 2% laminated tungsten, which I think is often gray. I've seen the color codes not be consistent, so I'm not going to go too much on the color code. I'm really just going to go on the type of tungsten. So a 1.5% or 2% laminated is my go-to tungsten. I use it probably 90% of the time. It has great art characteristics. Um, it's, it's easy to use and it's very versatile. So that's my primary go-to. The next would be serrated. Serrated, I've found, is a little bit better when you're getting into thinner materials or when I've had to do welding on contaminated aluminum. Um, like uh, cast aluminums or I did some welding on a boat before where my laminate was not working for me. I couldn't get the weld that I wanted to achieve. So the first thing I try swapping out is my tungsten because it's super easy and swapping out the tungsten fixed the issue for me. The next part is the nozzle you're using. So today we're going to be using a 332 tungsten. Um, you can get them in a variety of sizes, 16th of an inch, 332, 1 8 and generally the larger tungsten has a higher current carrying capacity. Um, but for a machine like this, I really doubt you'd ever need to go to a 1.8. Um, that would be the low end of that size. 332 is what I primarily do most of my welding with. Um, I don't often go too, too thin. I usually stay within about 1.8 to quarter inch material, sometimes 3.8 um, and you know, sometimes 16th of an inch or a little thinner. Uh, but like I said today, we're going to be using a 332 laminated tungsten. Um, pull it out of the torch here. It's held in by a collet and a collet body and then there's the nozzle and the shielding gas comes through the torch and out through the nozzle. And it's all about having shielding gas coverage around your tungsten because the tungsten does not want to be exposed to atmosphere. It will get contaminated as well. So when you're grinding your tungsten, you always want to be grinding it so that the grind lines are parallel to the length of the tungsten itself. If you're grinding it sideways on your grindstone, um, you're going to get swirled grind lines, which is really going to mess up the arc. And it's all about having a really good quality arc to get a really nice weld. Um, you always want to be using a dedicated grindstone. Preferably, if you can get one, get a tungsten grinder. I've seen them on Yes Welder's site. And I'm gonna have to talk to them about getting one because I'm very, very interested. I didn't know they offered it and I'm very curious. Um, the, the advantage of using a dedicated stone is that you don't put contaminants into the tungsten. Uh, when you're welding aluminum, it's all about clean, clean, and clean. You wanna have as little contaminants. And every step of the process is about getting those contaminants out of there. So dedicated stone grind with parallel to the tungsten itself and if you're using you know, different size tungstens, I always grind my taper to about two to three times the diameter of my tungsten itself. So if I'm using 332, I would be going with about a 3 16 taper, and I have always used a slightly blunted point. 
Uh, I go to a complete point when I'm EC tigging. On AC tig, I like a slight blunt. It helps get that nice arc. So next comes nozzle selection. Um, this can be determined by a variety of factors. Uh, I've found that 332, a, what am I using, a number six nozzle is really nice. If you go too wide with your nozzle, the cleaning action of the AC uh, square wave or sine wave will widen out and etch your material a little more. So if you're really wanting to have a nice clean weld with very little etching on either side of the bead, you wanna pull that shielding gas coverage in a little tighter. And that's what a smaller nozzle is gonna do. So as you decrease your tungsten size, you wanna shrink your nozzle. And as you increase your tungsten size, you want to increase your nozzle size. And this is all specific to aluminum welding. The one thing you won't be using is these Pyrex nozzles. You typically see with welding stainless because when you're doing stainless, uh, you want a very wide gas coverage. You're DC tigging, it's a whole other ball game. So again, if you're just getting started, don't think too hard about it. If you're using 332, go with number six. If you're using 16th of an inch, you can probably get away with um, you know, number five, maybe even a number four, that's getting pretty small, and vice versa. If you go to one eighth, you can go up to a number seven or a number eight nozzle size. It's really up to you. So I'm just gonna try and teach you here, show you what good results look like, help you get set up. And, uh, and then you have your back cap. And when you're doing all this, you wanna make sure that everything is nice and tight in here. If you leave things loose or the O-rings are messed up and you're letting contaminant, the atmosphere, into your weld, uh, you're gonna see it. It's gonna be dramatic with aluminum. And I think that probably covers enough to get you going on torch setup. The other thing I suggest if you're getting new to AC TIG welding and you're getting a setup, go ahead and most manufacturers, Yes Welder has a really nice consumable kit. It came with a variety of nozzles, back caps, uh, collets, the collet bodies that go inside the torch itself. Um, and diffusers, it, it, there's a whole beautiful setup here. It's gonna take the guesswork out of it. Just go order a kit, they're not that expensive and it will get you going really quickly. I really like this kit. Now that we've covered the basis of getting your torch set up for AC TIG welding, which didn't take too much, it's not that much different. Let's talk about the base metal, the aluminum itself. Okay, so let's talk about the base metal, the aluminum we're gonna be using today. I have cut up a bunch of coupons of 5052, uh, one eighth plate aluminum or sheet, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and with that, we are going to be using a 5356 filler rod. A good rule of thumb with filler rod selection is, for diameters is you pretty much can choose a filler rod the similar diameter of your tungsten. The only other rod I typically use is a 4043 filler rod, which I use for more aluminum alloys like castings, outboard bottom ends, engine casings, different things like that. It helps blend in all the impurities. But again, if you're just getting started and you're using nice new clean aluminum, 5356, go get yourself some rods. So there's an interesting part about aluminum is that the surface of the aluminum develops an oxide layer. And this is what is gonna fight us the most. Just like steel rusts or oxidizes, Aluminum builds an oxide layer as well over time. That oxide layer, the reason it's causing us so much problem is because it melts at a significantly higher temperature than the base metal itself. So you can imagine striking an arc on here and trying to develop a nice little molten puddle that you can feed rod into. If that oxide layer is really thick, which it just builds and builds over time, you're gonna have to put a lot more current or heat into that part to try and get that puddle formed because you have to burn through that oxide layer to get to the molten aluminum underneath. And that often causes issues because as you're trying to, you know, get a butt joint or any kind of weld, as you're trying to get that puddle joined between the two parts, it kind of wants to repel itself. It, the oxide sort of separates it. Um, it holds impurities in it. And what can happen on thinner metals is you're trying to heat it up to get a puddle formed and the actual base metal heats up so much that it just drops right out and you'll be left with a big crater. So what I always suggest, if you're doing anything with aluminum, just keep remembering clean, clean, and clean. I can't stress that enough. Get yourself a dedicated wire brush right on it, aluminum. And you wanna go ahead, wire brush that oxide layer off. Just scratch it up. And then when you've done that, go ahead with a nice clean rag and some acetone. 
wipe off all of that oxide dust and any oils that would be on there. And then you have a nice, clean, exposed, bare aluminum. And when you strike that arc, it's going to puddle up really quickly. It's going to fuse to the other part. And when you add filler, which I also suggest wiping down with acetone, you'll see why, it will just blend in really easily and your puddle is going to flow really good. So the other thing I want to talk about with aluminum, we're using AC to weld with and not DC like most other types of welding. And the reason we're using AC is a sine wave. It's got a positive half cycle and a negative half cycle. In the positive half cycle, the electrons are coming out of the part to the tungsten. And what that's doing is burning off or cleaning that oxide layer. And the negative half cycle is moving the electrons back into the part, which puts heat into the base metal, creating your weld puddle. So we have an adjustment on the welder called balance. And balance is adjusting in one cycle of a sine wave or a square wave. If it was a typical wave, it would be 50%. The same amount of positive time is the same amount of negative time. Balance adjusts that. So it doesn't change the length of the wave. Changing the length of the wave would be adjusting the frequency. Let's just consider us using the same frequency. So the wave stays the same length, but the negative and positive half cycle, we can change that duration. So that's effectively changing your cleaning action. With nice clean aluminum like this, we're probably going to be using a balance setting of around 30%. What that means is on your waveform, the positive or the EP, electrode positive, will be only 30% of the total waveform, leaving the other 70% EN, electrode negative. So 30% of that wave is going to be cleaning the aluminum and 70% is going to be welding the aluminum. If you got into more contaminated materials like castings or different things like that, you can adjust that balance up so you have more cleaning action and less welding. So you might say, well, why don't you just set it high and forget about it? The reason you're going to do that is, again, it has to do with that electron flow. To have a nice, efficient welding, you want to be putting all the heat into the part and ideally very little into the torch. It's going to get your puddle faster and it's going to allow you to move quicker so you weld faster. I mean, it's all about efficiency. The other issue is if you crank the balance too high, as I said, the electrons are coming out of the part into the tungsten. What that's going to do is overheat your tungsten. Tungsten is really good at operating at high temperatures, which is why we're using it as an electrode, but it can only handle so much current and so much heat before it just melts out. So it's always best to try and find the balance that's going to work best for you. And it's really trial and error. I mean, start low, turn it up. You'll notice that you're not getting much weld happening and your torch is overheating, which is also, I guess, brings me to the next point. If you're welding with too much balance, the limiting factor of a air-cooled torch like this in an inverter-based machine is going to be your torch. This is going to overheat, which is going to bring down your duty cycle, which is the amount of time you can weld for with, before you have to let the machine cool down. Something else I should mention when playing with the balance of your machine is that it's not only playing with the cleaning cycle and where the heat's going in the part, it's also going to affect your penetration. When you, and that's, that's one of the reasons why you also want to try and find the right balance. When you set your balance low, which is very little cleaning action, like 10, 20, 30%, you're going to concentrate that heat to a smaller area in your base metal, which is gonna allow you to get probably a, a faster puddle, but penetrate more. So you, you can wind up getting a stronger weld. When you crank that cleaning action up 50, 60, 70%, if you ever need to go that high, if it does go that high, that arc is spreading out and you're doing more of just heating the part than actually trying to get a good penetrating weld. And that's another reason why you just don't want to crank the balance up. You really want to try and dial that in. And it's going to take practice. It's going to take some, some learning and experience, but you'll get there. It's just one of those things. I guess the other thing to talk about, I might as well do it right now. We're talking about balance of that waveform and shifting that center point. 
The other thing is the length of the wave itself. If you shorten the time span in one cycle, your frequency is going higher. Frequency is hurt. I guess, let me tell you what we're going to be welding with first. Typical aluminum like this, we're going to be setting a frequency between 85 and 100 hertz. And you'll be able to hear that frequency change. If you need to weld thinner metal and you want to get a good amount of cleaning action, you're probably going to want to go up to a higher frequency because every cycle happens that much faster, which means you can move along a little quicker before you saturate your part with heat. I often don't play around with frequency too, too much. I typically weld kind of the same things. So it's something you can go ahead and play with yourself, but that adjustment is there. And if you want to learn more about it, go ahead and research a little bit on your own, but 85 to 100 Hertz is where we're going to set this. All right. Since we're talking about base metal and we've talked a little about filler rods, as I said before, when you're wiping your parts and stuff down with acetone, which is a safe, uh, chemical to use, safe solvent. It evaporates off really quickly with no residues and it's not going to harm you through welding processes. Uh, you're not supposed to use brake cleaner or things like that. It can, um, when exposed to arc, if it hasn't fully evaporated, it can create some very toxic gases which can really hurt your lungs. The other thing is wipe your filler rods down with acetone because they get oxide on it too. You can even take a scotch Bright pad if you feel you have some heavy oxide on your, your uh, filler rods and just run them through, wipe them with acetone, and it's just going to help you achieve that weld you're looking for. The other thing I suggest is have a really nice, clean pair of TIG gloves. TIG gloves are thick enough that, you know, they shield you from some of the heat, but they're thin enough that you can feel the filler rod. And again, clean, since you're handling all your material, if these were soaked in dirty oil or have carbon steel rust or different things on it, it's just going to contaminate that weld. And at first, I mean, you can hold the rod however you want and try dabbing in, but if something to practice is feeding the rod with one hand. And it's a bit of a hard thing to learn, but when you set up, because one of the other things I'm going to talk about when you're welding is being comfortable. And when you're TIG welding, comfort is going to be a huge factor in you getting that weld quality you want. So, you know, test your weld passes, get comfortable, Take a breath, and then when you're feeding that rod, if you don't, if you're moving your hand all the time, you're gonna push in too much, you're gonna pull away. And the other thing you wanna do is always try and keep that tip of your rod close to your TIG torch. You wanna keep it in that shielding gas, because if you feed your puddle, pull the rod out, that oxidizes, and then you feed it in again. So you really wanna hold it close, get stable, and learn how to feed a rod with one hand. That is definitely something I suggest being able to learn. The other thing I'm gonna mention is, if you're new to this, I mean, this video alone isn't gonna teach you everything you need to know. Uh, I'm not a expert, I guess you could say. I'm self-taught, although I've been doing this for 15 years. I've researched a lot, I've talked to a lot of experts, so I do feel I have a pretty good understanding of what I'm doing. But Yes Welder's manual for the CT2050 has some really good resources in it. I printed it out myself just to make sure that I'm trying to cover all the, the topics I should cover. So try and use some of those resources. I mean, most people probably haven't opened the manual to their own machine, but it gives a great breakdown of what all the components are called in your torch. It breaks down the balance, the frequency, your pre-gas, post-gas. Uh, ramp currents, all that type of stuff. So take a read on that as well. It's, it's going to take kind of exposing yourself to it several times to really start to understand what that all means.